Hey, we're Lauren and Stephen from Trip of the Lifestyle, and uh, we live about an hour away at the beach. We semi-retired uh, a couple of years ago, and we're excited to talk to you guys about travel hacking. So, as you probably know, travel hacking is using rewards programs, usually credit cards, to get free airfare and hotels. So I'll run through a quick example for you. Uh, the Chase Sapphire Preferred card, uh, if you spend $4,000 in three months, you get 80,000 bonus points and also 4,000 points for the one point per spend. So you can redeem that for $1,050 of free airfare um, and hotels. But when you do travel hacking, there's three things that you want to definitely avoid, okay? Uh, and the first one is paying interest on your credit card. Obviously, if you're paying interest on your purchases, uh, you're losing the game big time because these credit cards that come with huge rewards usually also come with the highest interest rates. So literally, like, I think my Chase F I prefer it has like 22% APR or something like that. But it doesn't matter. Uh, there's an easy way to avoid that, right? Just set your card to auto pay and pay it every month. You're good. You pay 0% interest, right? The other problem that crops up, the objection people have to travel hacking, is paying recurring annual fees, right? So again, going back to our standard example, Chase Sapphire Preferred, there's a $95 annual fee on there. So you have to pay the $95 um, once, right? So that's fine, compared to the 1050, it's not that big of a deal. But if you pay that every year for many years, it would totally detract from the whole point of getting that extra money, right? So how do you avoid that? Again, easy solution here, you either downgrade the card to a no annual fee card, or you can cancel it all together. You don't have to pay the annual fee after the first one. Problem solved. Third thing here is a little bit trickier, and it can be a little psychological too, which is spending extra money just to get a bonus that you wouldn't have spent otherwise. If you're doing that, you're kind of losing the game as well, right? So you got to think about like, just swap out the rewards credit card for whatever card or whatever method of payment you were already using before, and just go about your business exactly as you would, okay? If you do that, you're good to go. You're not gonna spend anything extra. Unless you get to that three month mark, you haven't spent the $4,000 yet, right? Let's say you're really frugal, you don't spend $4,000 in three months. Well, uh, in that case, you don't wanna just go out and spend extra money you weren't gonna spend anyway. You can solve that problem pretty easily too. One easy way to do it, there's a bunch of ways to do it, but one easy way to do it, go buy a gift card somewhere you shop anyway, like your favorite grocery store or Walmart or something like that. And then you're good to go, you've met the requirement, and over the next couple months, you slowly use that gift card as you normally would. Again, problem solved. So these concerns are not really huge concerns, not a big deal. But there is a big concern that you need to be thinking about, all right? Which is, even if you do those three things I just talked about, your travel is still not free on that Chase Sapphire Preferred or whatever credit card you're doing. And here's the reason why, all right? Those 84,000 points that you just spent to get 1050 in free travel, could have been turned into $840 cash on the Chase Sapphire Preferred. So logically, that forces us to say, taking your trip, your free trip, leaves you $840 poorer than you would have been if you didn't take the trip and you took the cash instead, right? So logically, we have to say, the trip didn't cost me 1050, but it also didn't cost me zero. It cost me 840, because that's the cash I gave up by spending points on that trip, right? So you gotta think about it in that context. So what we like to think about when we travel is instead of thinking travel hacking and getting free trips, we hack travel, right? So first you gotta admit, no travel's free. There is no free lunch here. Even if you're using credit card points, you're using credit card points that could have been cash. And even if it's like an airline card or something, you could have gotten a card instead that would have given you cash, right? So you're always giving up cash opportunity costs. So admit that it's not free, that's fine. It's okay to spend money on travel. So what should be your strategy then? Figure out ways to actually spend as little as possible on that travel and get the max value out of every dollar that you are spending. But admit that you are spending money. So our, one of our favorite ways to get max value is to do long-term travel. So that means taking months at a time rather than a few days or a few weeks at a time. What that turns into is actually spending less per day. I'll go, go through a few examples because I know that sounds a little counterintuitive. Um, for example, rather than paying for hotels, you could get an apartment. Hotels, about $100 a night, whereas apartments, you know, if you have an average apartment, it's $1,000 a month, it's only $33 a day. So there's a big difference there between a nightly hotel cost and your night in your apartment. While you're gone, you might be thinking, what do I do with my home back home or my apartment that I live in? Well, when you're gone, you can just rent your home out for extra income. If you rent, you can just time your leases such that you're ending one and starting another somewhere new and not have to worry about subletting. We've actually done both of these strategies and it works out pretty well. 
The same example can be said for flights. If you have to fly to your destination, a $1,000 plane ticket over seven days is $143 a day. I did the math last night, so I've got to check. Whereas if you split that over six months, it's only $550 a day. So again, a really big per day cost difference. Our favorite way to travel, though, rather than taking flights when you've got this long-term kind of time horizon, is to drive. We love road trips. So when you drive your own car, you save a ton of money on what you would pay in rentals or Uber costs. When we're going somewhere you can't drive to, we typically just sell our car and buy a cheap used one at that new location. And we did this when we went to Hawaii for six months. Uh, rather than having to ship our vehicle or figure out some crazy shenanigans with that, we just bought this Mazda Miata for $4,500 when we landed. Um, and after six months, we actually sold it for more, $5,600 and net over $1,000. So kind of a little perk too of the long-term travel is Maybe you make a little money in the exchange. That was lucky, but, it was lucky, but, but the but depreciation will be small no matter what. Yeah, so. over six months, you're not going to total the car and lose everything, hopefully, right? <laughs> but I'm sure you guys are thinking, like, this isn't that feasible, really, is it? Because the biggest drawback would be you've got to arrange such a travel time period. I mean, you've got to take a sabbatical from work or quit your job entirely, right? How do you make that happen? But there are a lot of pros namely being that you get to take a travel sabbatical or quit your job. <laughs> I mean, obviously that's a big plus for people in the fire community. An alternate to that though, if you love your job, you don't really want to leave, is to work out some kind of part-time work while you travel. We've done that too. And again, kind of, we've been over a few examples now, but that lower cost per day is a big benefit to this longer term travel. And probably the most important thing, and it has almost nothing to do with money, is getting a new perspective on your life when you do this longer term travel, taking a step back from the hustle and bustle. It, it really helped us to take that step back, take that time back for ourselves, to work on things that we love, like photography. It also gave us the spare time in our lives to actually start this blog. That's when we started the blog was on our road trip uh, two years ago. And kind of, I've already previewed you get, to it for you. you get to discover stuff about yourself. Like, that's the difference with long term travel. Is, is you're not like rushing to like do everything in seven days. You just like have time to think. And it's not just a, I only have so much time, so I have to like relax or I have to max out the time, right? You get to reclaim some of that back. So I kind of prefaced this earlier saying that we love road trips, um, but one of the ways that we make road trips really affordable is with our van. So for us, instead of paying for hotel costs every night, we pay no hotel costs because we sleep in the back of this van. Um, so yeah, there was an upfront cost to this to owning a van, obviously, but it's actually our only car, so um, that kind of cancels out because <laughs> it's both costs in one, pretty much. But to really make it economical is rather than paying to sleep, uh, we just sleep at places like Walmart, Cracker Barrel, travel centers. Um, you can also camp on BLM land or National Forest for free. And those are our kind of preferred places rather than staying at a campground, which typically runs 10 to $50 a night, depending on how fancy and the amenities there. And you might be asking, well, what about a shower? Because I guess I probably didn't tell you, this van is very small. You might have seen it parked outside. It's literally only a bed in the back. So how do we shower? We have a Planet Fitness membership for about 20 bucks a month. Both of us can go to any gym in the country, walk in, most of them are 24 hours, or they used to be, and shower. So, and sometimes work out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but hopefully the working out was done like out in the world, in nature, hiking, and things like that. And, and then you just walk into Planet Fitness to shower and leave. Uh, obviously, you know, you can do the long-term travel thing. Um, you can do the van life thing. Those are great. Those are ways to bring your per day costs way, way down on traveling. But maybe you say to me, like, look, I just want to take a regular vacation. I want to stay in a hotel. I don't want to sleep in the back of the van. I don't want to sleep in the back of the van. I don't want to take a three month or six month travel sabbatical. And I, I just want to stay in a hotel, take an air flight there. How do I do it the cheapest way? What's the way for me, right? We found that hotels.com is our go-to. Um, it's just outclasses all the other hotel sites. So that's really for two reasons. Number one, if you go, and I don't know if you've tried this, you probably have, because y'all are frugal and trying to get the best price on everything all the time. But if you go to like five or six of these different hotel sites, like Expedia or Trivago or Hotels.com, Priceline, whatever, you go to all of them, you type it in, you get the exact same list of hotels at literally exactly the same prices to the penny every time. And part of the reason for that is that half of those sites are actually owned by the same company. So there's really no point in doing price shopping between them. So what it comes down to, really, is when you're shopping for a hotel, which site offers you the best rewards for so for us, we found that Hotels.com 
totally destroys all the others in terms of rewards. Some of them don't even have a loyalty program. The others equate to like one or two percent. Hotels.com is close to, not quite, but close to like a 10% back. You stay 10 nights and you get the 11th one free. You have to pay like a little fee, so it's not really quite 10%. Um, but it's way better. So our go-to is hotels.com. And again, we just pay out of pocket for that. And then we get this 10% basically uh, reward back. Airbnb is a good alternative. Obviously, that is going to have some stuff that Hotels.com might not have, so it's worth checking there as an alternative. For flights, right? Sometimes you got to fly, you don't want to do a road trip, or maybe you want to go to like Australia or something. I don't know. But sometimes you get a flight, right? So, first go to is don't fly, driving is cheaper. We already mentioned that. Fair enough. The more people you have in your family, too, the cheaper driving is, right? Because you got to buy a plane ticket for each and every person. The driving cost is fixed. But if you can't drive, whoops. Uh, we like to get max value by buying super cheap airline tickets, and yes, sometimes that really does mean flying on Spirit or Frontier, one of those uh, you know less than amazing uh, airlines. But we like to think of it again as getting the max value out of every dollar we spend. That's really the mindset that we have. Now, am I going to take a Spirit flight that's like 14 hours long? No, probably not. But uh, if they ran to Hawaii, we probably wouldn't. Probably, probably wouldn't do that from Florida to Hawaii, but uh, we, we have done it plenty of times before, and it works out. And, and you really do get a lot more value out of every dollar spent by doing it. And by facing these costs for what they are, by realizing you really do have to spend money to travel, it, it confronts you with this dilemma like, do I want to take the Spirit flight for half price or whatever, or do I want to upgrade and get this nicer flight on like Delta or something like that, right? So. Uh, let's talk back to the travel hacking stuff. So, we mentioned travel hacking. We told you, here's all the ways to do it, here's what's great about it, Chase Sapphire preferred, blah, blah, blah. And then we bummed you out a little bit and we said, okay, but you're not actually getting free travel, which is true. But, uh, the thing is, uh, we still do travel hacking. But unfortunately, the stuff that we just mentioned, right, like a van or a six month lease on an apartment or even like a Spirit Airlines flight sometimes, a lot of that stuff you cannot buy in any way with hotel points or airline points, right? So you certainly can't buy a van or a, a six-month lease on an apartment with that stuff. So what do we do? Well, we still do credit card hacking. We still do churning. We still do travel hacking. We've signed up for 43 credit cards, I think. It's 43 or 44 now, uh, so far. And we absolutely go hardcore into that. I'm not saying not to do it. I'm absolutely saying to do it. But our strategy is one that you won't hear from too many people, all right? And our strategy, you'll probably, some people in this room might want to yell at me for this, but our strategy is redeem the points for cash whenever possible, immediately as soon as you get them. And there's a couple of reasons for that, all right? Uh, number one is you cannot invest airline points. You take your cash from your Chase Sapphire Preferred immediately, dump it into VTI or whatever your preferred investment vehicle is, and you can actually make a return on that. I've met people who have saved up tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of these His points. His dad has like hundreds of thousands of American airlines. My, my dad has lots of points sitting around with, with nothing to do. And here's what happens over time. It's not only are you not earning a return on them, right? But actually if you have an airline or hotel points instead of like cash equivalent points, they actually devalue the programs over time slowly. Every couple of years they change up the program. Sometimes they do it silently by just changing the prices on stuff in, in point basis, right? And your points are worth less. So there's almost like inflation happening on your points, right? And meanwhile, you're earning no return. So if you're gonna go with the airline and hotel points and stuff, that's fine, but make sure you're spending them soon um, instead of hoarding them and racking them up for a long period of time. Um, so generally speaking, we take cash, we seek out credit cards that pay cash, and then we pay for our travel outright, eyes wide open and, and understanding the fact that yes, we are paying for this travel. Yes, it's with money we got for free from credit cards, but we are paying for it. That money is money. It can be used for anything else, right? And that's okay. It's okay to spend money in travel. Sometimes we do redeem airline points or hotel points or whatever. We're not like against that. We're just saying most of the time we don't do it. If you've already done the cash bonuses that equate to 600 or 800 or even three or $400 cash, those are pretty good ones, right? If you've done all those, if you've gone through them all, and trust me, we have done all of them, at that, point, nice. at that point, it's fine to go and say, well, look, there's an airline card right now offering me $1,000 worth of airline points. Uh, that's fine, sign up for it. Maybe it's too good to pass up, not a big deal. But golden rule here is only redeem those points for things that you would have gladly paid cash for, right? Otherwise, you're not getting something of the value that they're stating in their marketing state. Right? If you wouldn't have paid cash for it, then it doesn't have the value that you're claiming that it has, or that that marketing claims that it has. So think about it that way. So for us, uh, how we redeem our points, 
We generally redeem them for the least expensive tier hotels on the hotel points. We try to like seek out the lowest tier hotels available so we can get the max number of nights out of our hotel points instead of getting a Ritz-Carlton or something and being like, oh, it's free, we can go to the Ritz-Carlton. Again, it's not free, right? And just taking coach flights like we normally would if we were paying cash. We would never pay for a first class ticket personally. I'm not saying it's wrong to do that, but personally, we would never pay for a first class ticket with cash. So why would we redeem our flight points for first class tickets? It's the same thing as paying cash for them. Not everybody wants to do credit card training. Not everyone wants to sign up for 43 credit cards in a row and just collect bonus after bonus after bonus and take risks with your credit score and do all the stuff that we do. That's fine, that's a reasonable perspective. Realize that if you're gonna take a simpler approach, you're not gonna get as much out of it, right? Like if you just take a card and spend on it and get the regular cash back, you're gonna get a lot less in rewards, but you can still get rewards. If you're gonna do this strategy though, if you're not gonna churn, you're just gonna grab one card, stick with it, uh, choose a 2% cash back card. Uh, with the bonuses, like I said, when you run out of good cash bonuses, fine, default to some of the airline hotel points bonuses, that's fine. But if you're just gonna get one card and stick with it for the rest of your life, Make sure you're getting cash. None of those hotel or airline cards pay out a consistent percentage back that beats 2% cash. They just don't, they don't exist. So our favorite card for that is City Double Cash, which basically just gives you straight up 2% cash back. Again, take that money, invest it, spend it on travel whenever you feel like spending on travel. Um, so yeah, that's, that's our, our deal here. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope I didn't piss too many people off by saying always we need your points for cash. But yeah, we would, we would love to entertain millions of questions. Thank you. Yeah, so I would say that like many things in personal finance, it comes down to you're going to get more value out of your money always if you can find a way to overcome your human psych psychology. I mean, we all have a thing that we think about in a way that is, in some sense, irrational, right? But I think that's exactly what happened to us, is, is we realized, like, there's no way we personally could ever justify taking it like a seven day trip for $3,000 cash. It's just not something that we would do. And I'm not saying it's wrong to do that. I'm saying we wouldn't do that, right? And so we found ourselves with that dilemma because we put ourselves in that dilemma because we have all the cash and no points, right? And so then that is what bred the creativity to be like, That was okay. literally what led us to our honeymoon, in fact. Yeah. We had just, right, this was uh, 2015 is when we went on our honeymoon, but we had just saved like over $100,000 working really hard, we were like just out of college, and it was like tough. I mean, we were working nights, weekends, we had side hustles, and we were like, we scraped by for these dollars. I certainly do not want to spend a significant portion, a few thousand of them, on a week or two. And so that was kind of what led us into, what are some other ways that we could do a cool honeymoon, and also like, hey, we're really burned out, what do we do about it? Um, and so I don't even know how we decided to take six months and move to Hawaii, but like that's, we were just like, yeah, that seems reasonable. We've never been there. Seems cool. Uh, flights are really expensive, so what if we just move? <laughs> but the bottom line behind it is like, we're getting so much more value out of every dollar. That Hawaii trip for six months, our living expenses in Hawaii were virtually identical to our previous living expenses at home and working in Central Florida. Florida. Oh, that's a great question. We get asked that all the time. So to put in context the 43 credit cards, uh, we started that process around 2012. After and we alternate it, so it's about 21 credit cards per person, right? And so that averages out to something like a card every two to three months, I think. So uh, more than half of those were canceled. We still have a stack of active cards that had no annual fee. We keep them if they have no That's annual fee. That's how we took that picture. <laughs> so if they have no annual fee, keep them. That'll buoy your credit score a little bit. Um, or downgrade them. The answer for us happened to be that we started out right out of college with credit scores that were, I don't even really remember, I want to say like high 600, like 690 or something, because we were just in college. Mine might have been lower, no credit I had history. no credit history and you had some. Yeah, we, we had no credit history. So, but the bottom line is, getting these cards and making on-time payments consistently for eight or however many years, yeah. made our credit score go up the whole time, no exceptions. So we're sitting at around like 820 or 822 now, something like that. Um, after doing 43 cards of training. So everyone always complains to us, like, you're crazy, this is gonna tank your credit score, this is horrible advice you're giving people. And like, I would say, don't go into it. Assuming that it'll be okay. Assuming the same thing will happen as what happened to us. You have to accept the risks that you're taking. But uh, what we always tell people, and it's the truth, is we went into it with the mindset of, 
We are never going to take a loan for the rest of our lives. We buy all of our used cars yeah. in cash. We bought two houses in cash. We bought all our cars in cash. Like, we just haven't done it. So we didn't care. We were ready to have 500 credit score. It didn't matter to us. But it turned out way better than we thought. So. Here's the hotel I can buy with my points. And here's the hotel that I can buy out of pocket. If I value those the same, that's a night in a hotel. It's what I need it to be. It's utility is that I get to stay a night at the travel destination that I want to be at. Well, then the redemption of the points is only worth what I would have gladly paid in cash to stay there anyway. So you have to ask yourself, if I had no points, they didn't exist, what would I have done? That answer is the value you're getting out of your points.